Hi, folks. Welcome again to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. I'm especially excited about this discussion because it will afford me the opportunity to share my good friend Derek Peterson with even more of the world than he has already taken over. <laughs> Personally, uh, made aware of Derek through mutual friends directing me to his blog, A Better Courage, which, uh, which trust me, you should check out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> you agree. <laughs> um, at the time, I was I was doing doctoral research on modern atheism, and Derek's blog and other writing made me aware of much more material uh, that I didn't realize I was unaware of. <laughs> and, but uh, but unfortunately for all you listeners and and for and for for me as well, uh, Derek is soon to give us a great gift a a book based upon years of of careful research and thought. It's titled. Flat Earths and Fake Footnotes, The Strange Tale of How the Conflict of Science and Christianity Was Written into History. Kind of a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> it's a little bit of, yeah, that's right. <laughs> the, title, the title sounds as much like a detective novel as the work of a scholar. <laughs> and that's exactly what I was going for. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and I can assure you, that it, uh, uh, the, you listeners, that it's both cutting edge and page-turning scholarship at the same time. Uh, and for... For any who read a lot of academic work, you know that that's almost never achieved. But do take it, but but don't even take it from me. In fact, uh, no less an intellectual historian than Peter Harrison, undoubtedly among the world's top intellectual historians on this subject, has publicly endorsed Derek his his book project and its urgency. And a large part of what uh, the reason I wanted to interview Derek and, and a large part of what Derek is doing. Uh, in this work is consolidating for lay people uh, an absolutely vast amount of recent work in several intersecting fields and, and revealing to all of us what has been going on in them and how their trends intersect and fit together. So if you, if you want to save $30,000 on books and just figure out what's yeah. going on in these fields, just, just know that Derek has already spent that money for you. Uh, if, you, I like that, yeah. <laughs> if you if you read anything from where I'm coming from, if you read anything on the the science Christianity conflict from a historical perspective, do buy Derek's book and then figure out what else you need from there. Uh, he's consolidated an absolutely enormous array of scattered scholarship and communicated it in a way that lay people can grasp in a single location and united as a single conversation. But I but I do warn you. Uh, this book is a little bit unsettling and will will make what seems like a natural carving up of the world seem very arbitrary and historically contingent. Uh, but as I hope the our discussion today will show, to realize this is actually good news because it helps relieve us of our of our false narratives and realize that the real developments of which we're a part are far more interesting and cool. Uh, in a way, and I'm just giving a I'll give a little spoiler here, Derek. Oh, I think please. this book, uh, largely, it, it seemed to me as I'm reading it, it's kind of a story about stories, uh, a narrative of how we began to, to narrate the tale of science and religion in the ways that we have and do. And, and one thing the book has really reinforced to me is just the simple power that stories indubitably have over us, even, even ironically when they point, when the point of you know, particular stories is that we don't depend on childish things like stories because we're, we're more like the valiant Huxley owning the buffoonish Bishop William Wilberforce. And, and, but of course, that, that just makes the point because as, as the book demonstrates, and I'm giving a little spoiler here, <laughs> the Huxley-Wilberforce encounter is largely made up, at least as we, as we remember it. Uh, but as a, the kind of hagiography that was needed at the time in order to sell intellectual loyalty to a new class of, of patriot saints, the, the scientists, this is the, you know, where, where, Bill, where Bill Murray's proverbial back off man, I, I'm a scientist, you know, started to re resonate in popular consciousness. Um, what is remarkable, though, is just how much the selling of that, of the religion science conflict, at least to me, what was remarkable about the book is just how much the selling of the religion science conflict really required a narrative in order to make sense of itself and to justify itself. And, and that works the other way as well. The, the other operative story is, is one which reads the available interpretive options through the symbolic lens of the slippery slope to liberalism. And so the modern debate between science and religion becomes a kind of cherry picked tale of scary stories about what happens when you start paying mind to those secular university folks. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet this narrative, as the book also shows, a, a you know kind of emerges at the same time as its opposite and acts as a kind of parasite on it. 
Uh, and like it is B, forced to simply ignore vast amounts of inconvenient, messy, historical information and exceptions, which amount not to only the conclusion that the story could be told otherwise, but that the story just is otherwise. Um, so today we're going to talk about these stories with Derek Peterson. Derek, thanks for joining us and, and thanks for writing this book. Oh, well, you're welcome. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I appreciate you inviting uh, me on. Oh, my, my pleasure. Um, I guess the first question everybody wants to know is, uh, when, when will this book be released? Uh, we're, in, we're in the middle of working on it now, and I think you have yeah. a deadline, but I don't, you know, deadlines can be exceeded, we know. So uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd actually love to know that question too. Um, I'm turning in the final manuscript at the end of February. I had a few setbacks, so like you said, I got a, a small extension on it. But uh, I think the plan is to have it out mid-year, um, probably second quarter time so I'm looking forward to kind of showing my baby to the world. <laughs> oh good. <laughs> um, and you know before we get into the more uh, into the more uh, you know sort of technical questions uh, I think it's always interesting to have sort of a personal spin on it mm. and so I wanted to ask what was the what was the real world catalyst that got you you know that drew you into this topic? Yeah well I, that's a great question. Um, because like, like you said, I, I'm really trying to couch the, the whole book in terms of a mystery narrative in some sense. Like I, I, I always enjoy, not the Da Vinci Code per se, but that type of um, misunderstood history, unearthing like things we thought we knew. Um, but as far as science and religion, uh, I really, I grew up kind of interested in the topic. I grew up in a very, very fundamentalist, ultra literal six day creationist church. Um, that even had some very vocal fringe members that you hear about, but don't necessarily encounter where Satan buried dinosaur bones to try and test our faith about the age of the earth. And, oh. um, you know, so from an early age, uh, the conflict of science and Christianity um, in one way or another was kind of impressed upon me. And uh, through high school, from my own intellectual survival into early uh, college days, I would, you know, read a lot of apologetics works, a lot of works on faith and science, how do they relate today? Um, and so it's always been a topic that I'm really passionate about because I love both. Um, you know, I was obsessed with dinosaurs as a kid and um, it just, you know, when people started telling me that dinosaurs were on the ark, it blew my mind because I really, you know, I wanted that to be true, but I was just really perplexed because it's not, you know, it's not in the story technically. You have to infer right. it from other presuppositions. And so, yeah, from an early age, there was this, tension I think of what's going on here how are people navigating this um, but to be honest uh, the history which is the history of their relationship which is really what my book is about and what I've been kind of obsessed <laughs> pathologically obsessed with yeah <laughs> years now um, it didn't really start until honestly my very last class in seminary um, I did a dual masters of divinity uh, masters in historical theology and I needed one last elective course and uh, my teacher at the time, Professor Mike Gurney, uh, Dr. Mike Gurney at, uh, I went to Multnomah University and Seminary, um, does a lot of work in science and faith. And we decided to do just some basic reading in the history of the subject uh, because it was just something that we both felt has been misrepresented, but there was just kind of bare hints, uh, you know, here and there where we, we, we knew like the Galileo affair wasn't really, you know, how it was typically represented. Creationism, he, and he, he's, um, uh, a creationist of, of sorts. So, you know, creationism, I think it, it kind of gets a bad rap from a lot of the other side or a lot of uh, Christians too. So we were just, right. um, you know, uh, with the Scopes trial and all that. So I expected to find, you know, one or two things to be really interesting revisions that I could sort of have in my back pocket for these types of conversations. But what I really found um, was like you said, the literature is an endless ocean. And, and it was kind of this embarrassment of riches that, that at least I stumbled into reading figures like Peter Harrison, John Headley Brook, um, David Livingston and, and others. Uh, you know, over the last 50 years or so, there's really just been this gigantic sea change in how historiography or the history of faith and science or Christianity and science has really been understood. And this has really been spearheaded largely by secular, quote unquote, thinkers who yeah. have um, not only debunked the idea that Christianity has constantly been at war with the sciences, but, you know, much to their astonishment, 
that Christianity has, while a, an exceedingly complex relationship with the natural knowledge of any given era, uh, has largely been beneficial in, in many aspects, you know, um, whether it's financial contribution, um, you know, the Catholic Church is the largest financial contributor to the sciences up until the 20th century of practically all institutions packed together, or whether theological premises were driving certain uh, right. investigative techniques or, or conclusions. Um, and so, yeah, I, that, that's really where the passion for the history piece started, because I got in that class, I got a real taste of um, just the incredible amount and quality of the literature um, that's going on. And, and the strange sense that no one, for the most part, no one in more explicitly Christian academic disciplines, to my knowledge, we're really talking about this. You know, we right. often talk about the, the renaissance of Christian philosophy, for example, in the 20th century, right. like Plantinga and William Lane Craig. But really, at the same time, from the opposite angle, the, the historical work that was being done, revising the, the popular notions that we often still hear through Richard Dawkins and the like, um, that they have been constantly at war, have not only been discarded, but the warfare thesis as a method uh, was sort of actively held up as um, how not to do history. Uh, so that's that's really, that's what started the, the passion. Uh, so right. like over the last five years or so, I've I slowly have been ramping up research and, and trying to just run my way through the vast fields of scholarship. How, how many books have you read on this subject? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I wish I had kept an accurate count. I a lot. It's it's a lot. Um, I would say uh, my best guess for this volume is to total sources. You know, including um, essays and stuff is probably around six or seven hundred. So okay, yeah, that's yeah. what it, it looks like. It's it's a yeah. uh, like I said, it's uh, it's consult. Like I, I became when I was doing my PhD, I became aware of some of this scholarship. Mm. But uh, as I as I've looked through your chapters. Uh, you know, uh, as it turns out, the, the scholarship I've been aware of, which is the stuff you just mentioned, you know, John Hedley Brook and David Livingston was just the tip of, in a way, is just mm. even even they are kind of consolidators in the academic community and sort, of, yeah. sort of the tip of the spear uh, mm. <laughs> of, what, uh, uh, of how far you can go. Well, um, let's talk about the material in the book proper. Maybe let's just start for the, for the audience here with the very words themselves, science and religion. Uh, we've, we've all heard fairly warfareish language about the supposed conflict or tension between these, and the the binary between you know science and religion feels like a na you know a natural binary to us. Mm. But but tell us what are what are some of the basic discoveries in the last generation or two of scholarship that have significantly complicated that image? Yeah, yeah, it's um I think this is an interesting place to start because it is, it's kind of revelatory of one of the basic impulses that's really fueling the sea change. And it's essentially taking another look at how our categories have almost pressed history into their own images. And so in some sense, it's, it's the age old dilemma of you're going to get the answers to the questions that you ask. Right. And when people are asking questions of history with our with how we typically tend to use science or religion as categories to carve up our world, inevitably the historical record then gets carved up into notions that look like those categories. And one of the primary spearheads of the sea change is essentially saying both science and religion, as we tend to use them today, themselves have very complicated histories. And I mean, for just for example, science as a category was not even as or scientist, I should say, it wasn't even coined until I think 1833 by uh, an Anglican science scientist. Well, he self fashioned himself uh, named William Huell. And right. there's major debates, we'll probably get into that later, but about professionalization and what kind of titles they should use, how the disciplinary boundaries should be redrawn. Um, so science itself, as we tend to use it in the English speaking world was um, uh, initially almost a polemical device against allowing things like politics or economics or theology or religion into a particular professional field. Um, so it's not necessarily a neutral term by any means. And this was actually promoted by Christians at the same time. So it's not like it's automatically, oh, the secularists are kind of trying to push us out. Right. No, this was right. a professionalized movement. Um, and on the other hand, religion um, has a, a, an exceedingly complex history. Right. 
which I, you know, we can't really get into here, but um, you know, when you read authors like Augustine in uh, the city of God, he explicitly denies that Christianity is religio because to him religio meant one's uh, cultic devotion to family and social obligations in Rome. And I right. want to equate Christianity and what we now call religion together. Um, and so over a vast series of changes, Christianity itself went through a transformation in the modern period, according to, to this scholarship, um, which more and more turned it into what we tend to carve up the world in as a religion. And so, whereas before Christianity sort of affected everything, it pervaded everything, it kind of became this, ironically, the more people paid attention to it as a religion, the more Christianity tended to shrink into its own specific domain over against what religion was being defined as not, right? The secular. The right. Secular, right, right. So, but the, the upshot of both of those are essentially when we're looking at the historical period, those categories break down. Um, but those categories are also necessary to create a warfare picture because if we don't have any clear cut sides, then it's not really uh, evident at that level. And this is just a basic entry level that people are warring about science and religion. Right. Right. It, I, I think it was my my friend Patrick Steffen who introduced me to to Brent Nongri's work. I think it mm, was. Yes. Yeah. He writes, you know, before religion, and he makes you know precisely the claim you were making. But he basically shows like before essentially the modern period, every use of this term religio or even analogous terms in other languages, there's nothing that quite corresponds in anybody's self consciousness to the modern concept of religion, which really is defined over against science and or, or yeah. the secular you know this sort of thing absolutely yeah, yeah. Nong nongri was one of the major influences on me and in particular his book was uh, important to me because one of the themes that i'm picking up on which i found interesting is how often the warfare thesis which or conflict thesis i use those interchangeably just for var variety how much they um they they depended upon a rewriting of history and on the religion side nongri's book is very important because um he had that whole chapter, I'm sure you remember, where religion as a concept was sort of reinserted into translations of ancient texts. Right. Um, or scholarly secondary sources interpreting those texts. And so it just kind of became part of a natural vocabulary. And it is, in, it, it's incredibly difficult to um, sort of train ourselves to unsee the things that we've been habitually patterned to see. Right. Uh, because, you know, we, we tend to um, criticize say, Islam for their particular organic unification of theology, religion, and politics, right? But, what, you know, whatever you think of Islam, that was, that's kind of the status quo for the hit, hit, even the history of the West. And it's only recently right. in Europe when those things have been just categorically separated. Um, and it's only in that way that they then need to be re-related to each other. Right. right. So... Right. Yes. So I guess the nutshell summary of that is essentially it, scholars began looking at history, essentially asking new questions without our typical categories. Um, and what they found then is differently organized organic holes where science and theology showed up on all of our supposedly clear cut sides when we were using science. Right. And categories. Right. Um, it, it, so we we've mentioned a couple of times uh, the conflict thesis or the warfare thesis. Um, can, can you tell, you know, for, for, the, un, for the uninitiated, what, uh, what is the warfare thesis, the conflict thesis, and what are some of the reasons that the warfare model was invented in the first place? You tell this tale quite a bit in the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's certainly the, what, the main theme, really. So I'll try to be as brief as possible. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, so I, in a nutshell, the, the warfare thesis or the conflict thesis um, is it's essentially claiming that every time that that science has through history perennially been opposed by Christianity in one way or the other, um, you know whether that's Christianity uh, destroying Greek wisdom as we we still often hear, you know they caused the Dark Ages essentially a thousand years where nothing happened. Um, they opposed Galileo. They opposed Copernicus. You know they burned Giordano Bruno at the stake for saying that infinite universes could exist you know, and on and on, opposition to Darwin, the Scopes trial. Um, but the creation of the his, of the warfare thesis is itself, it only occurred at a very specific historical, historical locations, so to speak. It didn't, it, it 
it didn't there the christianity has always had its culture detractors you know from celsus up to i know you're teaching a class using john loftus's book you know so there's there's a an esteemed line of um seeing in christianity irrationalism or you know its inability to deal with the world as non-christians tend to see it um but the warfare thesis specifically occurred um, surrounding the debates of, over professionalization of science. And John William Draper and Andrew Dixon White are usually the two biggest names um, that are linked to the genesis of this idea. And they almost single-handedly invented it. Um, that, that's one of the surprises when you're looking at all of this material is that there isn't really a linear continuous sequence of people writing the warfare thesis. It springs up at very particular contextual locations but then it reshapes history into its own image. So it, it sort of invents its own creation narrative of itself uh, in, in a sense. And um, I guess briefly to answer your question, I, we can circle back around to the professionalization debates. Um, and that's often what the, con the context for, for the, these creations are often what's lost because again, we tend to just sort of gravitate to our, our natural categories. And so often, you know, when you look at the Galileo affair with our particular lenses of science and religion, it becomes very easy to see that as, like you said, a scary story, a set piece that just has really neat binary sides. You know, obviously Galileo is on the scientific side. The Pope is obviously on the religious side, right? right. And so we create this, this neat narrative of opposition. And that's what Draper and, and White really did. Um, and they're not unique in the sense that they are obviously embodying many of the currents of the time that play into this complex weaving of a story. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that they whole, um, they invented the, the warfare narrative almost whole hog, so to speak. And they, they each have their different context. Just real briefly, um, Draper was responding to the recent um, uh, infallible uh, infallibilization, if that's a word, of the of the papacy under Pius the Ninth. Okay, and that infuriated him because it what he saw in essence is his problem was not with science or religion. Draper was uh, actually and White, and this is one of the the surprises. This is one of the plot twists that happens when we start mm. peering into the uh, historical details. Uh, both were for religion. A purified religion that didn't uh, d didn't use its authoritarian um, beating stick to kind of try and hamper free inquiry, and so Draper was ab he was driven absolutely mad by Pius the Ninth, who in his uh, career became more and more totalitarian. Um, but the the context there too is that the Catholic Church was responding to their own traumas in history, and so they were trying to circle the wagons. I mean, the Pope had up to that point been kidnapped three times. Right. Um, by twice by Napoleon and once by essentially being driven out um, for not doing a policy change that the Italians wanted. And so it just, um, the idea that, uh, so the Catholic Church was really up in arms about their own authority and their temporal authority because they, they felt they didn't have it. And when they didn't have it, they got kidnapped and they couldn't even do their spiritual authority, right? So there's, there's a real like, historical context there that are kind of driving these bo both of these sides but none of this can really be described in science and religion again there's all of these swirling currents in different terms that that are going on because again draper is not against religion and not even necessarily christianity per se um he is more against the authoritarian impulses of the church where he sees them and andrew dixon white is much the same way uh, he was the co-founder with ezra cornell of cornell university and uh, at the time, White, and he, the, the plot twist here is Andrew Dixon White, through his entire life, considered himself a God-fearing Christian um, mm. uh, of the liberal variety, admittedly, but... Um, even I didn't know that, so this is... <laughs> yeah. yeah, and this is, it's oh. just, it's really shocking. And so even that little piece starts to shake up the stuff that yeah. we thought we knew. Um, and both Cornell and White, again... They were not against religion. They were for religion. They were for Christianity. Uh -huh. But what they didn't like was authoritarian um, uh, conscription or uh, um, uh, authoritarian restriction of free inquiry. And both of them just got endless amounts of grief from the Protestant university establishment after they established Cornell, because Cornell was meant to train up um, individuals to be able to know cutting edge science, education, 
but not necessarily through a denominational affiliation. You know, they still had Christian activities. They had a very active young men's uh, Christian association on campus and stuff like that, but it wasn't denominationally driven. And so that they received endless criticism for that. And so at some point, White just couldn't take it anymore. Uh, and he sort of rolled up his sleeves and was like, OK, I'm going to show you something. Right. And so he then wrote his history, his two volume history of the warfare between science and Christianity. Um, essentially showing that true religion in Christianity has constantly been hampered by its own authoritarian impulses and has constantly hampered science uh, through that. But his end goal, again, is not to secularize Christianity. It's essentially to purify it, right? He, right. Uh, he, he, he's doing this in order to, um, he, to harmonize them in his own strange roundabout way. Right, right. Um, so... I, yeah, we, we can keep going and going and going, but that's the, oh, yeah. that's the kind of the nutshell of it. And so what happens then is it, it becomes, um, um, it's very difficult to break out of because we tend to focus on the arguments themselves, which is great. We obviously need to do that, but they're bringing in their wake like comets, a whole series of historical presuppositions that are already shaping uh, how we're assuming things are functioning. And so often to aim directly at the target in science and religion is to miss the target uh, because there's right. all of these other factors going on right well well just to 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 make this even more fun um <laughs> one of one of the the really i think enjoyable chapters in your book for a lot of people is going to be this this chapter that talks about the rise of modern flat earth theory yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, i have it on good authority that you are just a, a little bit obsessed with modern flat earthers. I, I, I'm ashamed to say it, but yeah, I, you know, <laughs> it's a fascinating but, movement. But it, it's a fascinating historical phenomenon as well. In fact, I think for a while, at least, um, I recall that uh, no, nobody less than, than Arthur Pink actually for a while was a flat earther. I, did, I uh, actually did not know that. That's yeah, cool. there you go. We're, we're helping that. each other out here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, What's really interesting in that chapter, it, particularly to, to me at least, was just the rhetoric of flat earthism and its mm -hmm. rise. And I, yeah. I wonder if you could make some comments about how the, uh, uh, as, a, as a historical uh, uh, phenomenon, how did, how did the flat earth kind of science religion uh, rhetoric somewhat parallel developing Christian rhetoric at the time as well? Because it's interesting to see that, uh, you know, we, nobody wants to be a flat earther, but it's interesting that some of their binaries and some of the ways they talk and some of their rhetorical appeals are actually somewhat similar to Christian reactions to science at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and this was this was sort of my introduction to the whole topic, to be honest. Um, I picked up a book by um, Jeffrey Burton Russell called The Inven Inventing the Flat Earth. And so it's just a slim little historical volume kind of looking into uh, where did this idea come from? Because uh, just, I mean, the, the, the spoiler here is essentially that in its entire history, there have been, I think we have maybe three total authors who held to a flat earth of, amongst Christians. And no one, no one followed them. They were, they were sort of the black sheep when they were, they were arguing about that. So the question uh, that really drives my whole book about how this mythology arises is where did the myth of the myth of the flat earth come from? Right. And, uh, you know, so Jeffrey Burton uh, Russell um, and another uh, author named Christina Garwood have really kind of done the heavy lifting on this and they've, they've tracked it down. And the weird thing is that during the, the professionalization debates of science, which intersected again with the Darwinian reception debates or the debates receiving evolution, weirdly enough, occurred at the same time that Christians actually started believing in a flat earth. And so that set piece to kind of anticipate later, it, it kind of got um, co-opted as a mascot for a lot of these people writing their warfare narratives, right? Because it's when people are doing it in their day, it becomes that much more believable that, of course, it's always been done this way. Um, right. But, you know, Christians have never believed in the flat earth. They have they adopted all of the clever Greek arguments about why the, the earth must be spherical uh, and in, indeed even improved upon it. Um, but as far as the rhetoric goes, what began to happen is it's sort of as we opened, as we talked about, when these categories of science and religion were formed, they were essentially boundary drawing um, for themselves to create. I mean, we can just conceptualize as two circles, science on the one side, religion on the other. And with professionalization, this started pushing a lot of incredibly intellectual amateurs 
out. They were no longer socially legitimate, right? They weren't part of this new club of scientists right. over here or this new club of you know professional religionists over here. And so broadly speaking in the 19th century, there, was, there were a lot of counter movements attempting to take back some of that social clout that they had lost. And the Flat Earth Movement, weirdly enough, really started as a Christian movement, a grassroots Christian movement, to try and restore uh, some of the prestige of the common man's ability to understand their world. Uh, you know, one of the rhetorics that we often hear is that science is just common sense rigidly applied. But historically speaking, that's not the case. Science always advances by what we tend to what us lay people tend to see as very counterintuitive observations. You know, I mean, just think of quantum mechanics. Right. That doesn't right. make any sense to us. Right. Um, but the same was to be said for, say, the evolution debates, because one of the one of the primary complaints, which we still hear today, is that no one was there to observe it. Right. Right. Um, and so what the scientists were saying, essentially, is that we, we don't need that present observation. And they were trying to kind of take the common man's ability to even look at their world and understand it and saying, no, it has to be filtered through a specialized uh, subset of highly rigid, highly uh, disciplined inquiry. And the flat earthers really started with this guy who self-fashionedly called himself Parallax. And I won't go too into it. He was this crazy huckster, you know, after the flat earth thing sort of ran its course, he started hawking cures for mortality you know, to people. But he was quite literally a snake oil salesman. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he was also an incredibly gifted orator. And he would go right. down to the town in, in the UK and essentially he would try to take on whoever would debate him in public. And he would run circles around them. Even if they were, you know, renowned scientists, he was just, he was just one of those people that always has you on your heels. And so he started generating this, this bizarre following. But one of the set pieces that he used was he was, in fact, one of the first people to use the notion of warfare between science and religion. Um, Interesting. And again, again, he was doing this, not to say that science and religion were opposed, but to harmonize what he called true science and true religion. Right. right. So, again, it's even when the binaries are explicitly being used, there's always something going behind the scenes that's making the, the, the categories completely messy, right? They don't, right. they don't actually apply no matter how much people are actually trying to force them on the details. Right. Um, and, and so the idea was essentially not only is he trying to take back the social prestige from the scientists, you know, he considered himself a sort of Robin Hood, a Baconian like Robin Hood to, for right. observation. Um, he also, he attached this to a, a, what he, argued was a literal interpretation of scripture because you know when you read certain passages in uh the old testament you can interpret them as saying that there's a dome over the earth yeah yeah the the four corners of the earth exactly right yeah and uh so this rhetoric sort of got combined and one to, to cut the story short what happened down the line is essentially one of the flat earth successors ended up uh, challenging Alfred Russell Wallace to a debate. And Wallace was the co-discoverer of Darwin, of the, the principle of natural selection. So he's a big wig, right? He's connected right. with everyone in part of these professionalization debates. But he was also a little short on cash at the time. And he's like, all right, I'm going to, I'll show this guy a thing or two. <laughs> now, I, I don't think anyone's going to be too surprised that he won the debate, right? right. But the, the person he was debating was sort of off their rocker and ended up hounding Wallace for his whole life. He actually had to get a restraining order against this guy. <laughs> um, and so this was incredibly bad timing because this is exactly the time that people like Thomas Huxley were writing their histories of Darwinism and their, or Andrew Dixon White and John Draper were writing their histories of the conflict of science and Christianity. And it became one of the set pieces of that story that was sort of driving a contemporary experience of this supposed warfare itself. But it was actually a very parochial, very contextually limited phenomenon that was happening and was responding to other very contextually and historically limited phenomena at that time. But as with everything in this, it sort of begins to float free of those moorings. And so we see them as sort of trans-historical universal categories of thought now. Um, And so interestingly enough, the flat earth really provides a nice entrance into all the themes that I'm sort of using in the book, you know, rewriting history, um, myths of myths, you know, so it's not just debunking right. what actually happened, but it's like, where did the misinformation come from in the first place? Right. Um, and just really the constant misuse and rewriting of sources is, a, you know, the fake right. part of this, because, you know, uh, I don't want to go too in 
detail and run over our time here, but you know, uh, constantly it's there's miscitations going on that just sort of get passed passed around, and that's a major source of how these things end up in textbooks because someone cited someone who cited someone who cited someone, and then it goes cold, right? Someone just made something up essentially or, or misperceived something. Yeah, actually. Uh, one question I did have, and we can get to it now, even though I had it later here, is yeah. uh, that'll be an interesting thing to talk about. Um, uh, one of these, one of these uh, uh, quotes that gets thrown around a lot is, you know, when you're trying to establish this uh, sort of sort of anti-rational impulse in Christianity, is this early Tertullian quote, right? You know, uh, I yeah. believe because it is absurd. Yeah. Uh, it turns out, uh, it, it, to this day, in fact, I, I, you mentioned I'm teaching John Loftus. Well, he's quote, John Loftus quotes this, to the, you know, 2012, yeah. my quote, it's all over the place. But apparently, uh, this is uh, one of those things that was never actually uttered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I, um, I went to Portland State for a while, and I had Peter Bogasian as a teacher. Who's, he's not one of the four horsemen of the New Atheist, so to speak. Oh, yeah, yeah. One of their wingmen. And he uses the quote in one of his recent books as well. Um, yeah, it, it, it's fascinating. So Peter Harrison has done the legwork on this, and he, he wrote a, a wonderful essay on where exactly this came from. And again, to kind of cut along a complex story short, Voltaire essentially made it up whole cloth. So Tertullian says, um, it, Tertullian's original argument is essentially that no one would have made up uh, the death and resurrection of, of Christ in, in the ambient religious environment of the time, because it both connected God to, to matter, which was, you know, a horrible sin amongst the Greek dualists or, um, or the very strains of, of Gnosticism that were arising. And essentially he's saying, look, no one would have, it, it's kind of the same arguments we get today about no one would use the witness of the women of Christ's resurrection because that's an intrinsically damaging to their own credibility. Right, right. And that's, and that's Tertullian's basic argument. He's like, no one would make up this idea that God became incarnate in Christ. Like it had to happen. Um, but through time, it sort of gets twisted and Voltaire ends up not only changing it into, I believe because it's absurd, but he also attributes it to Augustine. And so he kind of gets an even more influential source saying right. the essence of right. Christianity here. Right. Uh, but the weird thing is it really played into the formation of the category of religion, uh, as we were talking about earlier. And so to this day, like you said, we still hear the, the rhetoric that religion is defined by not only what it is, but by what it isn't. And what it isn't is rational. It's not secular discourse. It's not universal discourse. It's so limited and specific and perhaps even internal to the human heart that it has no rational means of discourse. Right. Um, but yeah, it's a great it's a it's a great example of the theme of the book because these things just go through historical contortions, and they they shape and uh, the, the our presuppositions about how these debates are going at all. Right. One of the one of the implications of of your book, and and, and I think one thing that you, you explore therein is is of course something that's still very relevant and live in our own churches and in our own communities, and that's the the recent Young Earth Creationist movement, mm -hmm. which, which uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, for the purposes of this discussion, of course, we're sort of bracketing the, the scientific and biblical analysis of yeah. the, the Young Earth Creationist movement and talking about it as a historical phenomenon. And it seems odd uh, because, of course, uh, a lot of Young Earth Creationists would make a claim something like this, that, you know, you know has it most of the church and history interpreted Genesis 1 is indicating that God created the, the, the universe within the space of an ordinary week. Um, and, and there's some, I, th I think what some of the scholarship is showing is there's, there's some superficial ways in which you can make that, that argument, but it, but it kind of covers over what are some profound discontinuities in how previous Christians are interpreting the, the Genesis 1 and how we're interpreting Genesis 1. Can you talk about, uh, can you help us clarify what are some of those discontinuities and, and maybe how the church fathers handle Genesis 1 and how we're handling Genesis 1? Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, that's a, a huge, great question. And uh, I'm certainly no expert on this. In fact, I'm, I'm working on the last chapter, which is sort of about this reception history uh, leading up to the Scopes trial and, and beyond um, for how evangelicals were using scripture and, against, uh, and interacting with science. Yeah, it's, you know, um, 
like you said, on a superficial level, you can point to a, a ton of authors who uh, more or less want to quote unquote read it literally, right? They, they want a seven day creation or a six day creation week. Um, but, you know, uh, and certainly uh, there are like allegorists who sort of do what they want with the text. But the, I suppose the, the gist of it is that it, the, uh, the variety of Christian interpretation or Jewish interpretation is so phenomenally complex that it becomes very difficult to kind of pin down like, well, this is just how we've always done it. And again, I think the history is really important because even posing the question in terms of, well, hasn't Christianity, at least in the majority, interpreted it as a more or less literal creation week? And even at that level, the question begins to kind of break down because we always have to ask what the content of our definition is excluding or including. And they didn't have evolution to deal with, so to speak, as uh, part of the information kit that they were using to interpret scripture, right? Even someone like Basil of Caesarea, who is a, a fairly staunch literalist, you know, he's still incorporating pagan science into, and he sees that as some of, some of the functions of, well, pagan science, right? Pagan natural knowledge. And he sees that as some of the function of what he must read in Genesis in his, his hexameral commentary. Um, so our, our concerns are often quite different. And so even when we sort of attempt to be faithful and repeat even verbatim something someone else said, the surrounding contexts of what we're working with will often then subvert or even completely alter the meaning of that sentence, even in the act of preservation. And in the Galileo affair, for example, it was held up by Cardinal Bellarmine and others that most through most of history, the fathers held a, a, a geocentric model, right? They thought that the, that the earth was at the center. And Galileo in his letter to the Grand Duchess Christina says, no, they, yes, they held that position, but they weren't arguing it as a position because they didn't have a heliocentric model as its polar opposite, right? So there's, there's a functional difference between holding a position uh, and the background assumptions of why that position is being held. Uh, so Galileo was trying to get around the fact that most of the patristic authors, yeah, they, they believe that here on earth, we're in the center of everything. Um, but, Gal but Galileo's point is essentially they weren't arguing it. They were arguing based on their data at the time, right? Right. Uh, and so with new findings, those are always incorporated, no matter how much someone insists on, you know, the sort of uh, hermetically sealed biblical world that they're just dealing with the text. Um, so, and I don't, uh, I don't know if we're going to get into, um, I can't remember if there's more questions on scientific creationism or not. So I don't, necessarily... um, I, I'd have to look myself. Uh, one, I think we will ask, ask one more, but just for the, for the listeners, if they wanted to look more into that reception history, is it, um, is it Andrew Brown who you'd recommend? I think that's his name. Yeah. Uh, there's... Yeah. Andrew Brown, uh, the days of creation goes into great detail. Uh, and I, yeah, actually, I, I, I recall, I got that recommendation from you, which it's just, I think it's one of the best books out there. Um, just in a single volume talking about the variety of interpretations of Genesis. Um, and I think one of the important things that he does is essentially show that though the, the debates over evolution were certainly in many ways a catalyst that sort of raised the stakes for a lot of people, as far as interpretive options go, there was nothing new about that. You know, I think one of the arguments that I hear on both sides is that trying to compatibilize a, an interpretation of Genesis with evolution on some level is a retreat position from the literal meaning. Um, and so that any non-literal meaning is automatically sort of negatively reliant upon uh, evolution as sort of the scary foe that we're trying to like ameliorate or, or defeat. But all of the interpretive options are, are there through the entire 2000 year course of, of Christianity uh, and, or, and Judaism. Um, and so I think that one of, I mean, the, one of the major points of my work is deconstructive. It's kind of a call to, look, we all need to be a little more uncomfortable with how all of this went down. And, but at the same time, we also need to relax a little bit because 
Right. The, the way that we tend to immediately enter into these discussions has so many presuppositions that have been um, sh sort of shaped by a forgetfulness that kind of appears as our memory now. Um, right. And, and so, you know, the, just the idea that any non-literal interpretation of Genesis is automatically a fallback position for Christianity is just simply untrue. Uh, and in fact, a literal interpretation of Genesis as opposed to evolution was almost unheard of until just leading up to the Scopes trial, you know. So it's not even necessarily that we can connect 19th century creationism to the 20th century varieties. They're, they're all different schools and they all have different concerns and they're reacting to different contexts. When I was in my, when I was in my doctoral program, these are, these are folks we've already mentioned here uh, a, a moment ago, but uh, particularly when I was reading the writings of folks like uh, John Headley Brook and David Livingston, I was, I was constantly struck by how much the, the typical response of the church during an alleged conflict between the Bible and natural philosophy was not what I've often called the, the trump card approach, you know, where our interpretation of one source of ever revelation automatically uh, trumps our interpretation of another source. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about a bit about that and maybe tell our, our listeners, you know, what their appetite. This is well known, of course, is really well known in the historical world, this Galileo yeah. encounter. But maybe you could introduce us, for perhaps those who have never heard, what, what, what do basically even secular historians at this point agree about that how, how Galileo really went down versus the kind of myth? Of yeah, Galileo. yeah. You know, and the, the Galileo affair, I, I always... Uh, see it as a kindred spirit to Pauline scholarship in the sense that, uh, you know, you, <laughs> it's very intimidating to get into uh, because there is just, everyone's writing gigantic thousand page books about it. And, um, but the, yeah, the general consensus is, um, is well, it's, the general consensus is that it wasn't science versus religion at all. Uh, and again, in part, this is because our categories just utterly break down when we're looking at all the actors, because even to the bitter end, Galileo considered himself a good Christian, um, you know, and uh, to jump the gun a bit, you know, one of the mitigating factors of how the story is typically told of, you know, Galileo on the one side and the church on the other is that uh, initially uh, the Pope uh, who became Urban VIII, it, it, he was actually close friends with Galileo. Um, uh, Galileo was initially delighted that he had been, um, that he ascended into the papal throne because he was a man of letters. He loved astronomy. He wrote poems about about the stars, uh, you know, so he wasn't some, you know, anti, uh, he was some fideistic schlub who, you know, just wanted to shun reason and shut down the sciences and, and torture all of its uh, practitioners. Um, you know, and I'm sort of uh, just to, to comment on our own habits here, I keep using science uh, and religion as sort of shorthand terms. And that's part of their power is it's not easy when you're doing this because you don't have a ready-made substitute, you know, so I'm sort of using them as placeholders here. Um, but to, yeah, to circle back around to the creationists real quick, one of the, the new things that happens with them is like you said, this trump card approach where there's almost a, a deductive relationship between scripture and what nature must be because of a particular reading of scripture. Uh, but that's really a fairly new feature. And one of the wrinkles in the Galileo debate is how, uh, all sides, um, and there were many sides trying for many different, um, their own opportunities and their own ends. Everyone used science and everyone used scripture in, in different ways. Um, and uh, uh, what, where's, I'm trying to look for the book real quick. Um, uh, anyway, there, uh, a, real, a recent work, which I can try to find later, um, has, has sort of outlined how people like Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo, uh, the Jesuits, the, the Catholic Church, how all of them were incorporating scripture into their scientific musings, so to speak. And uh, the, the brief of that is essentially that none of them used scripture in a way that made demands, made unmediated demands of the natural world. All of them had uh, different background theories that were mediating how the text itself made sense and how the text itself spoke to the natural world and what kind of conclusions we should be expecting to see from it. Um, and on the other hand, science itself was not one thing, right? So we can't just say scripture relates to this one entity we call the investigation of the natural world or natural philosophy or whatever. 
because there were a variety of different interpretive options on what science or what investigation of the natural world even was. And one of the primary wrinkles is, and it's still going today, is a realist versus a non-realist or a functionalist interpretation of science. Or in right. other words, um, do our scientific theories actually describe the world or are they simply con convenient, you know, heuristic devices that don't actually describe the physical nature of reality, but they're useful for prediction, for understanding, for comprehension. Um, and that's a real, that, that is actually one of the hearts of what was going on in the Galileo affair. Um, at the time, we tend to assume in our histories that Galileo was right. Right. I mean, obviously right. he was right. I'm not arguing right. for geocentrism, but, right. uh, <laughs> you know, the way that we tell it is that Galileo sort of had indisputable proof and the, those who opposed him in the Catholic Church, he had many, many allies, but those who opposed him in the Catholic Church were sort of willfully ignoring the obvious. You know, they shut right. their own eyes to see the world. Right. Uh, but, but again, that's one of the how a uh, mythological set piece that really um, sort of conditions us. It primes us to see things in certain ways, because what historians have really kind of hit home is that Galileo by his own standards didn't demonstrate that in fact the earth rotates around the sun. Um, you know, we tend to think of our satellites and our ability to kind of see the universe from that God's eye perspective, so to speak. But when you're here on the ground, it becomes very, very difficult. Um, and so a series of myths sort of enhances that too, because the idea was essentially that the Ptolemaic geocentric system had at that time uh, sort of accumulated so many ad hoc hypotheses it was no longer really viable right and so automatically that that kind of enhances the stark contrast of of mighty Galileo sort of dragging us out of our ignorance with Copernicus and that the church is saying no you know we like staying in the dark don't you know don't listen to that guy over yeah. there um but one of the one of the uh, most fascinating uh, stories amongst this revisionist scholarship is by Owen Gingrich, who was a former astronomer at, uh, I believe it was Harvard, but don't quote me on that. And he's also a, a, a believer. Um, you know, so he, uh, he actually discovered that, no, actually, as far as predicting where things are in the sky, the Ptolemaic and the Copernican systems were relatively identical. Um, right. So what's going on here is the, prefer for, uh, the preference for different models. Copernicus had his own ideas of what uh, simplicity must mean, uh, his own ideas that, you know, God would obviously uh, create things uh, in a simpler manner than the Ptolemaic system. He hated these things called equants and sequence, which were these sort of artificial mathematical constructs to kind of make the Ptolemaic system work. He still had to rely on them, but he, he shrunk them down a little bit. Um, so, but the... The end game for that is essentially saying, look, Galileo didn't prove his point. Um, and uh, in uh, uh, the book uh, that Davenant re released, uh, which you invited me to, to contribute to, I, I hold up these two quotes, one by Cardinal Bellarmine, who was the, uh, in charge of essentially uh, accusing Galileo and of course right. Galileo himself. And if you don't attribute who said which, not only are they very, very close to each other about how they think scripture and science should relate, Galileo actually has stricter standards. And he says that one has to have an Aristotelian level of deductive demonstration. So essentially, he almost has to demonstrate that it is logically necessary for the sun to be in the center for him to con even consider reinterpreting passages in scripture that appear geocentric. Right. By his own standards, he failed, right? So what happens is essentially all of our, our categories of science and religion break down because most of the complaints against, uh, against Copernicus and Galileo were still, I suppose, broadly speaking, scientific. And the, the scriptural reasoning were so vastly complex that, again, it's not a trump card approach. Um, it doesn't constitute a single strategy uh, and it doesn't relate to a single thing called, uh, called uh, science because where the functionalism and the realism debate plays in is that um, when Copernicus published, uh, it got picked up by a bunch of Lutherans who were very, very stoked on these ideas. And a guy named Andreas Osiander wrote an anonymous preface to Copernicus's book without his permission and essentially said, look, these are convenient mathematical hypotheses that help us predict things like Easter, um, but they don't actually describe the physical layout of the system, right? So one of the reasons that, that 
Galileo and not Copernicus sort of set off the alarms of the church is that there was this tradition of reading it as sort of convenient mathematical fiction. Galileo shifted that. He wanted to insist that this is that, you know, I am describing the physical layout of the cosmos and there's right. nothing to do about it. Right. Um, and one of the things the Pope says is he literally, uh, he repeats almost verbatim what Osiander wrote in, in uh, the preface to Copernicus saying, look, I don't care. And this, this is the Pope and Bellarmine's position. I don't care if you teach that the sun is at the center, as long as that's simply a, a mathematical heuristic, right? Right. But Galileo wanted to take that extra step and say, no, this is my system. This is a physical layout. We know what we're talking about. You know, it doesn't matter that most of his cherished proofs turn out to be completely wrong uh, right. by our standards today. You know, his intuition was correct. His aesthetic uh, intuition about the layout of the system, along with a, a lot of his sort of anti-Aristotelian, anti-Ptolemaic observations through the telescope, um, sort of allowed him to create this theory. Uh, um, so, yeah, the, all of that is to say that it gets, it gets incredibly, incredibly complex. And there is no, there's no clear cut sides here because Galileo was condemned not for teaching that the, the earth orbits the sun, um, per se, because he was condemned for teaching that as a physical hypothesis without further proof. Um, which again, I'm not saying that that was the right decision, right. but most of it was not based upon what we would today consider religious reasoning. Most of it was still based upon the fact that um, Galileo had not made his case and yet he insisted on it. And in the counter-reformation high stakes atmosphere, it looked like Galileo was then trying to interpret scripture for himself and so appeared as a Protestant, right? They, so they right. had this, this heretic yeah. in their ranks and they had to stamp that out immediately because of all the stuff that was going on elsewhere with the reformation that they were dealing with. What, one irony that comes to mind from that is um, uh, you might be aware of uh, Robertson Genis, uh, who's this uh, Protestant turned Catholic, uh, one, of, one of the guys in the 90s who converted to Roman Catholicism from Protestantism. Uh, and, you know, was sort of all the rage among Roman Catholics because he wrote this book, you know, not 700 page, not by faith alone. Well, uh, what's funny about Protestants who convert to Roman Catholicism is they remain rather Protestant in their in, in their <laughs> yes, in their. Indeed, yeah. And so uh, he went on to publish a 1,600-page book called Galileo Was Wrong, which is a contemporary 1,600-page wow. tome of you know sort of <laughs> sort of anti-heliocentrism, you know, alive <laughs> and well even today. Right. Wow! Uh, so, wow! You know, for one of your nerd, uh, you know, late night things when you can't sleep, you 1,600 pages of anti-Galileo. When uh, it might be worth asking, for historians of science, of course, you know, for scientists, you know, you know, most people accept helio the heliocentric model these days, obviously. But for historians of science, when do they say sort of what the decisive experiment was? Uh, usually, that we could, where scientists could say, like, okay, you know, pretty much universally among the sciences, everybody needs to believe this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um... You know, off the top of my head, I don't know the exact point, but it certainly was not until Newton and New the Newtonian system um, that it became more or less uh, established that this has to be the case. Um, you know, people like Kepler were certainly heliocentrists and, you know, avid promoters of both Galileo and Copernicus. But again, the functionalist versus realist debate kind of, it colors the whole thing because it's right. really hard to land on something. Because you run, in, you run into the really interesting historical phenomenon of, people who fully accept Copernicus and Galileo's system and yet retain a sort of geocentric reading of scripture because precisely because they're interpreting them as function as just functional. As right. Like, right. Fictions. Right. So I have no need to necessarily change until further proof is given. Right. Um, but yeah, it's certainly uh, not, not until after Newton that this, this becomes to be seen as sort of a factual basis upon which we have to base everything else. Right. So, and that's, that's a constant theme, too, is we tend to retroactively um, sort of assume uh, the end game is already sort of latently present in, in earlier discussions, right? Right. And so we, again, we sort of attribute, well, Galileo was obviously right, so anyone who opposed him is, is you know, an unwashed and unlettered idiot. Right. But that's not the case. And, and frankly, I think just the thought experiment of what if you didn't know, you know, that the sun wasn't the center, like wh how would the universe look? And the answer is actually, it looks identical, right? Yeah, <laughs> all right. Foundationally, it's not easy to establish. Um, 
And there was there, and it wasn't just between two options either, because people like Tycho Brahe had a third way model where yeah. uh, the Earth is still at the center and the Sun rotates around the Earth, but all the other planets rotate around the Sun. Right. And uh, interestingly enough, this was infuriating for Galileo because observationally, it was identical to his own findings. It incorporated all of the sort of anti-Ptolemaic aspects that ca- that that Galileo was really championing without necessarily abandoning a Giglio. Yeah, like a actually, that, that Roman Catholic I just mentioned, uh, St. Genis, he's, he's drawing a lot on Brahe. Uh, this oh, is okay, this, okay this, yeah. This, yeah, that his, makes uh, sense. Yeah, his, his guy. Um, well, we, we've talked about a, a kind of so-called liberal myth about Galileo, so let's talk about a conservative myth. Uh, sure. if we could use, use that kind of anachronistic binary. Uh, and while this has nothing to do with whether or not anyone can or should be a Darwinist on the question of evolution, again, we're, we're kind of bracketing that question for our purposes, it's interesting to note that the, the story of Darwin's reception, this is another myth that's interesting and surprising, that is, uh, conservative Bible-minded evangelicals were often not as dismissive of Darwin when he was first read, it seems like a lot of the literature is arguing. And so uh, what does modern scholarship say to us about that first, you know, half century or so concerning the reception of Darwin? Yeah, that, uh, yeah, again, this is just another topic that is very much like, say, Pauline scholarship, or really any topic, really, just the, the endless amount of monographs written, uh, you know, the, the sheer amount of data that one has to take in. Uh, it, it's really fascinating. But I think there's several key points that can kind of be distilled from it. And the first is that we really have to distinguish between Darwinism and evolutionary theory. And we tend to kind of conflate those two things. Right. But really the only unique aspect of Darwin's contribution was the theory of natural selection. And obviously his his immense observations as he was going through the Galapagos Islands uh, that made it into the origin of species and the descent of man. Um, because evolution had been on the table for quite some time, not just in that century, but really there's kind of, uh, one can trace historical paths. I mean, back to the Greeks, if you really wanted to, um, I think I, I tend to find that rather pointless just because of all the transitions that happened. It, it makes it unclear to me whether it's a one continuous discourse or not. Right. But, you know, uh, evolution had been on the table for quite some time. And, uh, by conflating the two, people then tend to see uh, Darwin in the same image, say, as Galileo or Copernicus, as sort of these isolated geniuses that pop into history and sort of allow us to step out of the religious dark here. But Darwin was, was calling on a lot of, of prior work. And some of, the, some of the key features of that are that those works were not just, quote unquote, scientific, but they were theologically and religiously saturated. Um, I'm working on an article, who knows when I'm going to complete it, but how uh, just Darwin's use of theology, even in the origin of species, that's very often not commented upon. Um, And what happens is that scholars more and more are insisting that the debates over evolution and the debates over Darwinism were internal to Christianity itself. They weren't, it wasn't like Christianity or theology on the one side and science and with secularists on the other, this was really a border dispute between natural theologies and natural philosophies uh, that Darwin himself was still participating in. Uh, and one scholar has even gone so far as to call the origin of species the last example of Victorian natural theology. Um, mm. Because Darwin essentially incorporates um, almost all of William Paley's design assumptions in order to use that as a baseline to kind of look at the world. He's asking the same questions that these natural theologians were asking. He is looking at the world often through the same categories, many times to flip them on their heads, but not necessarily explicitly to counter man the, the broader theological impulses. Because Darwin, uh, until really after the origin of species, was adamant that his was a, a mostly theistic system. Right now we can we can debate how consistent that is, but that's you know that's obviously like we said we're bracketing that for now. Um, evolutionary theory was always seen as an alternative way to envision God's active and continuous providence. We right. tend to identify it with de- a sort of deistic detachment, but natural laws were there and they were enacted because there was a natural lawgiver. Right, natural laws only later began to assume a sort of secularist interpretation that if one accounts for something by natural law that's ruling God out. But that right. wasn't the case at all in these debates. So that's one of the major wrinkles here is that the players on all sides were 
for the most part, religious and theologically saturated one way or the other, right? Now, the, the next step that needs to, a few next steps that need to be made are who do we agree with? Who do we think was being inconsistent? But again, that's for another time because the baseline demonstration is it's the rise of evolution, the rise of natural law theory, the rise of Darwinism were not automatically seen as anti-Christian, anti-God, anti-theistic. It was in fact within the domain of the common assumptions of Victorian natural theology. Um, so all of the players kind of fall out onto this spectrum. Even someone like Thomas Huxley, who, who said that if we talk about God as um, the one who ensures that this orchestration of the whole is, is following through its natural courses, then he's like, sure, that's fine. Um, you know, and he, you know, he coined the term agnostic. So he's not even, you know, the new atheist type that we tend right. to um, see today. But one of the features of this debate too, is that people like Huxley, because of their desire for professionalization, and Huxley had constantly uh, been denied jobs because he wasn't explicitly religious and he was an exceptional person, right? So that, that bitterness of the establishment came fairly honestly in certain parts, but it begins to transmute into a religion versus science narrative in which he rewrites the history of natural law, of kind of a methodological naturalism as solely the provenance, historically speaking, of the agnostic or the, even the atheist. Um, and so what was actually often internal or broadly saturated by theological themes, more and more by people like Huxley gets retroactively rewritten as this neat separation between theology and religion on the one side and science on the other and science conquering and pushing religion to the one side. Um, so that was a, a long winded explanation. The nutshell is essentially that us, even amongst evangelicals, uh, the, their major, major hangup was not evolutionary theory. And it wasn't even Darwinism per se. It was the, I suppose, the philosophical naturalism or anti-theistic naturalism that often became attached to it. Right. Um, because, uh, again, an yet another wrinkle. And, and these wrinkles just keep going down and down. And going, down. Yeah, I know. Yeah. The major reception. So today we tend to look at natural selection as the major feature that Darwin uh, kind of injected into the debates of the time. But the curious thing is that at the time when Darwin was initially being received, no one liked natural selection. That wasn't a feature until the 1940s when Mendelian genetics became attached to it, that it was sort of reintroduced as sort of the central feature of Darwinian thought and in an explicitly anti-theistic way. Um, so again, we're sort of, we're seeing history through glasses that have been tainted by, or, or at least shaped by later, later um, changes. Uh, because even Thomas Huxley, ironically, for the most part, was only very reluctantly accepted natural selection because he had a vision of nature that was perfectly sequentially uniform. And he saw natural selection as too random. Uh, so Darwin's hype man himself didn't accept fully all aspects of the theory, right? So it's, I guess the end game for that is just at this point, we just need to be really careful when we're talking about these grand sweeping assertions of what caused theology to disappear or, you know, what is anti-theistic or not. All sides, you know, were populated by pious and non-pious people. Uh, and, and so our, our categories are, are often just too fuzzy. And I mean, just to end, you know, uh, the, the first American promoter of Darwinian theory was an evangelical Asa Gray at Harvard. Um, right. So. Yeah. That, act, that naturally leads to this, this next question is, you know, how do, how do you think developments in scholarship on the history of science and religion help us to read the development of modern atheism as well? This is a, a, a mutual interest of yours and mine. I yeah. did my dissertation on modern atheism. But not, but not quite on this aspect of it. And it seems like, you know, one of the things you're saying is that, uh, you know, if we read something like the history of Darwinism originally, this was in some ways an intra, you, you said, in, in kind of intra-Christian dispute. Yes. Um, and, and yet its development and the development of modern atheism have some, like, very rough parallel. How do, how do those kind of streams of development sort of intersect? Uh, yeah. You know? 
Um, yeah, so originally I wanted to actually have my final third of the book be on this topic, but un- the chapters, the initial chapters sort of swelled beyond, so I, I'm kind of saving that for maybe a, a sequel one day. Um, but yeah, one of the, I think, um, just to reference your work here, and, and please correct me if, I, if I'm misunderstanding it, just so talking about the phenomenology of atheism, it, again, it's sort of, I think, trying to get into uh, around the back of a lot of our presuppositions of why the world feels different to us than perhaps it did 500, 1,000 years ago. And I think um, amongst the many factors, one of the factors is, again, the stories that we tell of how we got to where we are and sort of these secularization narratives that incorporate the inevitable decline of religion in the face of rationality, in the face of science. Most of these, in fact, turn out to be, again, sort of willful inventions and not really ones that do justice at all to the historical record. They've kind of become deconstructed. Um, To circle back around to John William Draper and Andrew Dixon White, uh, they really didn't do themselves any favors, obviously. I mean, it becomes very easy to misunderstand their intentions, which all of us essentially have done by seeing them opposing Christianity full stop, right? But again, they were harmonizers. But immediately, immediately their work got picked up with people who had less um, pious intentions for it. And so the harmonization aspects sort of get cut out of the warfare narrative. And so the warfare narrative is ironically has its own myth of how it got started. So there's, you know, the myth of the myth of warfare, uh, because uh, immediately it got picked up by secularists and free thinkers and atheists who sort of co-opted all of the details of the Galileo affair or Christian flat earthism or the Christian dark ages. And cut out the idea that they're trying, their end game is to try and synthesize a new theo- theological scientific harmony. Um, and these, interestingly enough, all occur at the beginning of several disciplines. The discipline of university uh, professional history, the beginning of the professional history of science, the beginning of the professionalization of science itself. And so all of these narratives start to be picked up right at the birth of how the disciplines themselves are formed. And so, for example, a guy named George Sarton, who's often considered the, uh, the, the father of the American discipline of the history and historiography of science, uh, saw both White and Draper, uh, Draper's narratives as great history, but then he incorporated it into a sort of dry as dust academic textbook. So, you know, these two books that were sort of announcing their polemics on their front pages have sort of been naturalized and kind of quietly put into textbook sort of nonchalant textbook variations and so right and sartin was um a secular humanist like full stop he 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 was completely against religious interpretations of christianity and science sort of this this um he was kind of an ardent opponent of some of this revisionist stuff that we've been talking about so his his portraits are always very good guys, bad guys, right? And the bad guys are inevitable right. religionists. Um, so the the warfare narrative, the complexities that it attended to it, even amidst all of its own reductionisms, it again kind of gets filtered and reduced, and then sort of quietly migrates out into, especially America, the American textbook system. And so you know, even my friend was saying the other day that her daughter learned in class, you know, that Galileo. Uh, you know, was opposed by the Catholic Church, uh, or that Columbus set sail in part to prove that the world was round, right? Right. That's, that's another complete myth that, yep. that doesn't occur until the 19th century. We don't have to get into it, but it's just a fascinating set piece. So these things keep sticking with us because they keep cycling, and and they they have this sort of veneer of academic credibility because Sartin was a genius. He was an amazing, like, we owe him essentially the major debt of starting the history of science. Like, this this right. is not this is not some chump, but at the same time, his credentials sort of overshadow the fact that what he essentially did was rip most of the fantastical parts out of Draper and White and leave all of the religious harmonization there. Right. So one of one of the things that uh, one of the challenges I think that you know I walk away from from a text like this, and we've talked about this a little bit before privately, but it, it's just that. Um, uh, you know, one of one of the things that is 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 uh, really behind the debate, uh, modern debate between religion and science, is whether or not kind of professional academic disciplines can ever have an agenda or be biased. Yeah. And uh, 
one of the uncomfortable things that your, uh, your, your book sort of reveals is, well, yes, in fact, they can. You know, and the implications of that don't, aren't necessarily go become a flat earther, obviously. Right, right, right. <laughs> Nevertheless, yeah, probably not, actually. Uh, neither of this, in a way, this, this is why I mentioned, uh, I think, at the beginning of, uh, uh, of this, this session that we're having right now, uh, there, this, this is a kind of uncomfortable narrative for everybody, in a way. I mean, it's it ruining a lot of our own kind of inherited Christian myths, but it also says, like, Actually, you can't just always trust the status quo. Sometimes the status quo, never, nevertheless, maybe there, it's, there's something to be said that uh, uh, another thing the book does give us is what does it look like when the status quo is misleading us? You know, one of the things we can do is actually point to like, oh, we, we can actually see the moves we're making that are a little bit suspicious as opposed to other things they do. This guy's a genius on the one hand, but, uh, you know, when he does that, we can sort of see it pretty objectively what he's doing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think one of my one of my worries is, as I've been writing this book, is really with the rise of the rhetoric of fake news. And, you know, right. on, you know, it's what right or wrong, whether at the end of the day, what I'm doing ends up being correct or if I'm corrected or if people accept or reject it, you know, it's hard work. And I you know what what my fear is, is essentially some of my young earth creationist friends who have kindly read some of my manuscript immediately latch on to the fact that the establishment did, in fact, willfully obscure certain aspects of these histories to create sort of this conflict narrative, right? Um, and I think they're right to do so. They were right about that. There was a lot of that stuff going on, but they tend sometimes, and these are very intelligent people, but they tend to, and I do this myself, so I'm, I'm chastising myself just as much, is we tend to then, again, co-opt that into our own narratives and just say, I don't need to pay attention to that. It's fake news. It's not real. I don't need to pay attention to that. But the claims here are that we can actually very specifically trace where sort of illogical leaps or mythologies have occurred, right? So this is, I'm attempting to be, to demonstrate this instead of just claiming that these things happen. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that, you know, a lot of the fears about secularists, quote unquote, I hate that word, but for convenience, yeah. we can use it, you know, they're trying to, that they were trying to crowd out religious aspects of higher education or whatnot. Yeah, yeah, they were, they really were. I mean, the rise of sociology, as, just as an example, as a discipline, uh, you know, and this is from the words of its founders themselves, they saw themselves as not only supplanting uh, getting rid of religion or super or supernatural interpretations, but they wanted to supplant and, and take on the role of religion themselves, right? They were the, the new shapers of society, so to speak, and, and sort of a substitute, a, a proxy religion almost, um, you know? So th that some of that fear is very legitimate, but what I don't want to happen, therefore, is to say that we don't need to take it seriously or that we can just kind of stamp this whole thing with a fake news sign and say, let's move on all our presuppositions turned out to be true, right? This is like you said, it's uncomfortable for everyone and it should right. be. Yeah. Right. Actually, that gets into sort of the penultimate question here. Um, uh, one takeaway is, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning of, of our session here uh, from your book is just the power that storytellers have in, in shaping how these debates play out yeah. uh, and, and, and which options seem plausible to people. And this is precisely why demythologization is so important. And yet, and yet, in its place, in the place of demythologization, while perhaps backed by a much greater degree of plausibility, is nevertheless another story. You know, in a, in a way, your book is telling itself, telling a story about, about yeah. development of stories. And I can imagine, you know, somebody going meta and saying that, you know, what if the story you're telling could be told another way? That is... Uh, like the question, you know, one of the things you mentioned is uh, in your book, it's a really lovely line, basically, uh, the question of which morality is most consistent with Darwinism. Uh, it turns out that it's whatever, whatever morality you want to read into Darwinism. It's more <laughs> yeah, like a mirror absolutely. than actually giving you a coherent morality. Yeah. But does the historical evidence function that way as well? In other words, is it, is it a mirror that reflects back to us whatever story we want to get out of it? Or and if not, why not? Uh, you know, how do we... How do we sort of save ourselves from being able to, like, as we just said, with this sort of like, you know, fake news kind of narrative, we could easily turn this all into like, oh, this is a big thing about fake news. How do we kind of um, 
balance ourselves and calibrate ourselves to, to be truthful with this kind of information? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And it's something I struggle with myself. So I'm certainly not speaking as an expert on it. Um, you know, in some sense, this book is I'm just trying to share my absolute perplexity with the world and hopefully someone yeah. smarter than myself <laughs> can make something constructive out of it. Um, yeah, I think, well, for one, it's, I, I do think that there is, um, there is definitely the, uh, the risk of, narrative simply being narratives and, and not touching the bedrock of, of reality, so to speak. Um, this, this more thick, this, this sort of thick description or narrative based description, so to speak, came in the wake of the fall of the movement of positivism, um, which sort of had a naive um, understanding of, of how facts work and how they can construct theories. Uh, and in the wake of that fall, the idea was that, you know, we have to sort of begin to look at broader aspects of how science was formed, like the socio-religious uh, economic backgrounds and, and so forth. Um, so I think one way to sort of avoid this, we're just making up narratives to fit some agenda uh, is, again, I at least am trying to, to my best ability, exhaustively track where my sources are, why I'm telling the narrative this way. And so if someone disagrees with me, I would hope that they would do the same thing. And so we can, we sort of have that baseline to start talking about stuff. Um, but to be fair, it does in some sense rely upon the emphasis that one wants to place because when we, we were just talking about how secularization sort of affected say textbook reception about religion in the American system, not all of the people who are doing that were atheists. Many of them were Christians who simply thought that secularization in one form or another was a good thing. Right. right? So depending upon one's emphasis, right, if you think secularization is a good thing and you emphasize it that way, you might not necessarily care about the Christians who are promoting it. You care about the people who act more like you, right? So one, one of the themes of this book is what I call deleting theology. And uh, the emphasis selection that happens here is that when someone's writing a book on economics today, for example, they're not necessarily going to be that interested in the religious aspects that played into Adam Smith or even Thomas Malthus or, or later e economic commentators because they're writing a book for students to go out into the marketplace today and make a change, right? But this is actually a history that is thoroughly saturated by theological and religious presuppositions and practices, right? right. Um, right. So Emphasis does play a key factor, and it's, it, it really just depends on how you're trying to, what, what, what story you are trying to tell. But the way to control that is we always have to ask, okay, what, what appears to be either the explicit or the implicit end game of this book or that story, right? Because the end game of the story that I'm trying to tell is not necessarily that there's always been this sort of buddy-buddy relationship between science and Christianity, but that the question of what the relation between science and Christianity or science and religion is, is an ill-formed question. And there's a, there's a real beautiful kind of um, complexity that we need to, to wrestle with. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, sort of going off topic here. Uh, so to circle back, I, I suppose the first is simply, I am doing my best to exhaustively detail where I'm getting my sources and interpretations from. And I hope anyone else would do the same. Right, right. And sort of, on top of that, diving into the contexts of where I disagree with prior interpretations or where scholarship today disagrees with prior interpretations, why they disagree, how, uh, what were the contexts that allowed what we're now calling an insufficient interpretation to arise in the first place? Because I think, and I think that that's a key, a second key question that we need to ask. So the first is just citations, like track your sources. The second right. is if you disagree with an interpretation, it's not just overcoming that interpretation to promote yours. I think we, we tend to not ask why that interpretation skewed in, right. the, it in the first place. And that's a major factor of these stories because once you kind of get into the nitty gritty of the details, it's never science first religion. There's always this cloud of, of kind of organic interconnections that are happening, whether they're personal beefs, institutional um, you know, laws that we're not necessarily looking at or so on. Right. Uh, and so it's always just being, it's just being diligent and, and just sort of showing your work, so to speak. You know? Right. Well, one of the, your, your first chapter is on this kind of enigmatic character, uh, Pierre Duham, is that how you say his name? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 
you know, and it seems like a lot of the, the story he began to tell, he's one of these kind of seminal figures that really helped us begin to revise the historiography, I think is yeah. sort of part, part of the argument of that first chapter. Uh, and yet it, it doesn't seem like he brought necessarily a narrative to the sources. It was really the sources themselves that just made him realize, well, gee, this narrative that we have is just wrong. <laughs> and so yeah. really the invention of the narrative that we're finding in even you know, a secular academic scholarship seems to be just be driven by confronting the sources themselves and just staring at them uh, and seeing yeah. what they actually do. Um, what, uh, the, you know, the train will, the, 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 the trademark final question I ask to, to all my visitors is this, is, and that's in, in respect of the, the conversation we're having now, what, what do you think we should be asking about this, this topic? What, what, what conversations should be going on in all of this, in, in anything we've talked about that aren't going on, and what kinds of questions should we be on the alert for, mm. uh, assuming, assuming that those who ask them, you know, sort of, sort of, sort of get what we've already talked about? Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, for me personally, my end game, sorry about that, my phone's going off. Uh, my, my end game for this uh, is several things. One is, we already talked a little bit about it, but the, the self-perceptions and the sort of self-fashioning narratives that led to the rise of atheism. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think apologetics works, they're incredibly useful, and they, but they, they tend to dive right in to the questions that atheists rightfully pose, you know, problem of evil, the apparent absence of God, and so forth. Um, but I think with your work in particular, I, I find that it's so helpful because it kind of gets around to the backside of a lot of the questions we're asking. And so I think the question um, that maybe some of the listeners or viewers today like to take away is, how did we get here? Are our questions inevitable? Are they natural? Are, are the categories we're using the right categories? Um, because we often, I think, we tend to lose before we even got started because we tend to accept the playing fields that are often given to us. Um, but as these histories begin to show, you know, uh, just as an example, we often, the phrase of, you know, making, of being relevant to the, the ambient culture around us. Um, I think that that's an, an interesting and a good question, but just historically speaking, a lot of this historical scholarship has uncovered how theologically and religiously saturated our supposedly secular situations already are, and they have forgotten these roots. And so to ask the question of how to make ourselves relevant to the surrounding culture is already to lose in a way, because the surrounding culture has all of these latent religious and theological themes that can be historically demonstrated that need to kind of be, you know, summoned again. So that there can be a baseline demonstration that, like, look, uh, we don't need to necessarily uh, demonstrate the use of theology or religion because it's already everywhere, right? And it's just sort of been um, forgotten and stamped out. Um, so the, I suppose that's one question. And the other, que- the other thing I think that we need to focus on is, is really just taking a deep breath and trying to be more comfortable with complexity and... Uh, not necessarily having a grand narrative in our back pocket to throw at people. Um, You know, because it's not just secular people who are making these myths, Uh, you know, in the 20th century, in some sense, the, the, the myth of war became real. It became incarnated because both sides began adopting the myth and making it a reality and couching everything that they're doing in terms of that rhetoric. You know, after the Scopes trial, people essentially got the stage play that they wanted in order to neatly divide the world between religious um, people on the one side and scientists on the other. You know, and the rhetoric of true science versus false science is still there and all of that. But we, we tend to imbibe uh, the, these historical trajectories to such an extent that even if they're mythologies, we begin to enact them and create them as real. Um, and so just taking a deep breath and just the biblical exhortation to be not afraid, so to speak. Right. And just allow um, the historical actors to sort of speak on their own terms and not immediately be slotted into one or another of our narratives to get to go somewhere. Right. Right. I think that's really helpful. Well, folks, I have been talking to my good friend, Derek Peterson. Uh, Please look out for the book coming up in the next couple of months. Again, Flat Earths and Fake Footnotes, The Strange Tale of How the Conflict of Science and Christianity Was Written into History. 
Derek, thanks again for joining us today and for giving us this, this grand wisdom. Um, and until next time, we'll see you guys later. Thank you.